Here we go. Um, this talk will be recorded um, and posted to our YouTube page, um, as well as the Objects of Agency virtual exhibition. Um, and even though this exhibition is closing um, at the end of the year on December 31st, um, it will be taken down um, from the main part of the website, it will be archived in our past exhibitions. Um, so you'll be able to um, go back and visit the exhibition on there as well. Um, so I'd like to open this talk today. We started this year-long exhibition um, as a response to the overturn of Roe v. Wade. Um, we had our first part one of the artist talk in June. Um, some of you were here for that or some of you watched it on um, YouTube afterwards. Um, and we really framed that discussion. I felt like it was like really, we were really amplified and we were really excited to talk. And it was um, around the one year anniversary of this Dobbs decision. Um, and now we're six months after that. So I think this talk today, um, for me anyway, or at this part in the exhibition is really about reflection, um, reflection on the past six months since the last artist talk, the past um, 18 months since the Dobbs decision. Um, and as some of you might know, it's Hera's 50th anniversary um, in January. So I also, something that really strikes me and I'm putting this exhibition together strikes me is that this Dobbs decision was made and Roe v. Wade was overturned right before its fifth, own 50th anniversary. So some feminist legacy that ended right before it turned 50 um, and how we are going into our 50th year and what happened there. Um, Hera started with a group of women who came together to really they wanted to show their work and they demanded to show their work and have it here. And we've miraculously been able to carry that on um, throughout these 50 years. And I think that's something really remarkable and I'm um, honored to be a part of. Um, and so I really, I wrote down a couple of questions actually that I just wanted to sort of have, they're in the back of my mind. And I guess I just wanted to share them um, with everyone else. Um, at the start of this talk, um, or really my biggest question is, um, when we started writing this call, or I guess when the idea of this call came to be, um, after the Dobbs decision, we came together at Hera and everyone sort of looked at each other. We weren't surprised or shocked or anything. And we knew this was coming, but it was sort of like, well, what do we do now? We thought we were doing all the things we were supposed to be doing. And it's clearly, not enough. How did this happen? And what do we do? And we had wrote a statement. And we really said, well, we can cry and we can rage and we can make art. That was our statement. And now I wonder, as we go into this 2024 election season, mm -hmm. into our 2024 50th anniversary, um, is that still the same? Is that still what we do? Or what else? Uh, what else can we do? What do we do now? Um, and reflecting back on what we have done, um, and think about how that can progress um, into the future. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, I actually had some images I wanted to show while I was talking and I got so invested. Um, so here are some of our images from people who will be talking tonight. Um, as you all know, um, this show has been going on for a year and we've posted one person on Instagram to highlight um, every week. We had 52 posts. Um, our last couple of posts are coming out, um, I guess, in the next uh, 10 days. Um, and I also have this graphic on here um, from the Washington Post um, about what abortion rights look like um, in the U.S. right now. Um, this image came out um last week or the week before, I believe, um, and where these restrictions lie and are um, and what we're going into, um, what things look like ahead. Um, so for the rest of the talk, what we're going to do is I will um, go through each participating artist in alphabetical order. I will introduce your name when your slides come up. 
Um, and then you will have five minutes um, or about five minutes or so um, to talk about your work. We're going to save all of our question and answers for the end of the session. And I will pass the baton over to our assistant director, Marissa, um, who will open the Q&A for us. Um, and just before we begin, I just I once again would like to thank everyone for being here today, um, for everyone who submitted work to the show um, and was brave um, to make this work and to share their voice um, and to be here to talk about their work with us today. Um, it's just so important and impactful um, what we're doing. Um, and of course, I'd just like to thank our community and our sponsors and our friends of Hera um, and for the Rhode Island State Council of the Arts for um, financially supporting us um, so that we're able to do this hopefully for another 50 years. Um, okay, and with that, oops, my, here we go. There we go. With that, I'd like to um, introduce Jenny Belisle. Um, thank you so much. And I just want to say thank you to the gallery for curating and administrating this important exhibition. I can't believe actually a year has gone by. It's like gone by so quickly. Um, my name is Jenny Belisle. I've been an artist and administrator, an advocate, an educator, and curator and writer for over 25 years at this point, <laughs> for quite a long time. And I've been very fortunate for the exhibition and the opportunities I've had, but I've had to work hard for it. You know, at this point, I've submitted over almost close to 1500 proposals and submissions. And so arts advocacy is a really important element to me. And I've served as the Arts and Culture Commission of Contra Costa County Managing Director here in California and on the Richmond Arts and Culture Commission. And a few months prior to the Dobbs decision and part of my social art practice, I founded an arts organization called Arts CCC, which is Arts Contra Costa County. And this was just due to historic low governmental funds for the county in which I live, which is only $35,000 a year for 1.1 million people for decades. And so, I learned as a woman um, that when structures consistently fail us, we must create new ones and do a lateral move for equity. And so we've moved forward as part of my social art practice. We write grants and we do social media and we manage an art program at Juvenile Hall for Poetry Series program. And right now we're advocating to include young women. So this artwork is part of my social practice as a social political artist. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. And so I do from digital to found object. And so the core of the concept of my work is really to investigate truth. And so I research, I'm a researcher, I'm a political nerd. And through all those different types of arguments, I like to identify those patterns with the natural and man-made world. And that really dictates this final form of work. And this artwork titled Woman is digital and it's photography combined. And it really was created to highlight how extreme climate impacts have magnified through this pandemic relationship. And now a year later, you know, people act like there's no more COVID. So <laughs> it doesn't exist anymore. And so this is part of the Saturday night series where um, I document that that litter the, every morning I walk near the Pacific waters, and this was a discarded hanger that I had found. And this, to me, really represents a self-portrait of our humanity. And not only is it the Dobbs, it's like, how are we living in environmental impacts with laws that are hindering our basic health care? And just for myself in the last year in our community, we've dealt with a hillslide atmospheric rivers, bad air quality, and then the access of healthcare continuing to be under assault. And so I think I'm really excited for today's positive discussion because it really proves that the work that we all do here is that we're fighting and pushing forward despite everything through art. So thank you. Thank you, Jenny. That was great. Um, next we have Deborah Diesman. Oh, I think you're muted, Deborah. 
Hi, that was so fascinating, Jenny. Thank you. Um, my name is Deborah Disman, sort of like Diz man, Diz woman. <laughs> um, and I'm based in the Los Angeles area. Um, I'm thrilled to be part of the show, to be part of this talk. Um, I've, I've been very fortunate to be involved with the Hera over the past couple of years through shows and talks. And when I saw the call for this show, I knew it was something that I really wanted to be involved with. Um, my work uh, for this show and in, you know, in many respects has a great deal to do with embodiment. Um, I'm just gonna read, cause it's just a little easier, a, a couple of lines of my statement, <laughs> my most recent statement. Um, Bringing initially from the form of the book, specifically the Western Codex, my work traverses tapestry, installation, and sculpture to push the familiar into forms that arrest, baffle, and bewilder while simultaneously offering rest, solace, and contemplation. And I feel like that's a bit what the arts do is they, they compel us to question and unsettle us while also giving us a space to kind of be and um, and rest in the moment of our questioning. Um, uh, this piece uh, very much relates to embodiment um, and it wasn't just the form of the piece um, called excavation of the interior. Um, it was also the, the feeling of creating the piece, the very physical aspect of building it and then building it out with the breast-like forms, um, uh, the, the strings coming down. Um, you know, I think people do respond to it as a female body, but it can also close. And I would show it in my studio right now, but it's in another show um, in the LA area right now. You can actually tie those strings together. There's a series of strings on either side and you can close it up. Um, and you know you can also open it. To me, this is the most compelling view, but with many three dimensional pieces and book arts in particular, it's very, very challenging to show because in this piece, the hanging strings are kind of standing in for the pages. And they're also expressing um, aspects of the human body, of the female body. Um, but often with pages and with all these different surfaces, it can be very challenging to show it. You can, and especially in an online show, um, you can only show certain views um, at a time. So um, I'm thrilled to be able to, to have this um, view shown. I feel like in regards to Roe versus Wade and the Dobbs decision and what we've been going through around this for a year, that is, of course, very much related to embodiment, to the body, to the right of us um, as women, as people, as cis women, um, et cetera, to, to, to make the decisions about our own body. But it, it, all, it is also expressing the strong feelings of those who support this limitation and this restriction, the feelings about the body and controlling it and what um, those entities feel about the body sort of from what you might call the other side of the question. It's very passionate for people um, as we live within our own bodies and interact with others um, in many ways through the body there's really no other way to do it. Um, and, and so that was kind of my motivation behind creating the piece and also uh, for submitting the piece to the show. And I'm, I'm very fascinated to see all the different ways that people have responded to the call in terms of the types of work they have submitted. It was just very interesting to hear what Jenny had to say coming from the, the Bay Area, um, my old stomping ground. And I, I can't wait to see and hear what other people um, have to say about their work and subject. So thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, next, we have Andrea Fortenu.
Andrea, are you with us? Okay, we can come back if you're able to hop on. Um, next, we have Mary Kostman. See Mary on here. Mary, can you hear us? Yeah. Can you see and hear me now? Yep. Oh, okay, great. So what I was just saying is, Sonia, the way you're showing up on the screen is it looks as if you have angel wings that are made out of coat hangers because oh. <laughs> and it's right in the middle. <laughs> so um, I also wanted to thank you for having the courage to create this show. There are not a lot of places where we as artists can exhibit um, as a group, you know, in controversial subjects such as this. And um, I'm reminded that um, several years ago, my partner, my male partner, who was a successful artist, um, commented, I was doing a series with panties and his comment to me was, you have to be careful about what you're putting out there. You know, it, it, like implying that you didn't want it, didn't want to get labeled in a certain way. And um, so the fact that we are all participating in this exhibition is contradicts what he was saying. Um, I use, these are monotypes and um, I'm also a painter. And I use hands a lot in my work, especially in monotypes. And I see hands as, you know, hands can be used for healing. They can be used for reaching out for peace or comfort. And they can also be used for invasion and abuse. And um, so that's, basically what these pieces are about. The second one on the right, mine, I think speaks for itself. Um, abortion has been present in my life, was present in my life in my younger days. And I did have an illegal abortion. And let me tell you, I would not wish that on anyone. Um, thankfully, I wasn't damaged, but um, it's a very scary process and it's it's just horrifying to me that so many people in our country you know feel that they have the right to tell me and us what i can do with my body and that they have the right to tell me to have a child that maybe i wouldn't be able to take care of um let's see um i think I think that's pretty much all I want to say. If you have questions about the work, um, ask ask me later. And thank you again. Thank you, Mary. Um, next we have Rose Malenfant. Hi, thank you so much for holding this space for everyone. Um, I feel that this is where the change not only is planted, but is grow, grown and sustained in environments like this, providing nourishment and support um, so that we can have like a, a healthy endurance throughout the process. And I loved how you were reframing everything um, in like a reflection and a reevaluation with all the time that has passed. And I'm sure as artists as well, you know, us making our work at a certain period of time and how it's how it's grown or revealed more to us um, later on when we revisit it or how our work has shifted since then. Um, so I thought that was a beautiful framing. Um, in this work, I was really thinking about how time and gravity forms our bodies. And I like experimenting with this materially. At the time I was um, doing a series of experiments pouring plaster inside of nylon pantyhose. Um, and it really was formed by the time and by the gravity. And I like that it, it it held a history of that story because I feel that our bodies are like that. We're, we're vessels of what time and gravity 
um, has done to us and what has what we have inherited, um, whether that's beautiful memories or whether that's racism or trauma, we have all these things held inside our bodies. Um, so I was interested in the plaster because it was malleable. And then when it hardened, it, it kind of held that form and that story of gravity. Um, so I was really thinking about what was trapped inside the body. And this sculpture, um, I was originally just working on it as a sculpture and it was hanging in my studio. And late one night I, I looked at it and there was a pair of pantyhose that were hanging pretty low to the ground. And I, I just had the thought urge or curiosity. I wonder if I could try this on while it's still hanging and suspended. And then I did, and it transformed the meaning of this work for me because I was thinking of all that is trapped and all that is hardened inside of us. And it became this act of seizing agency by choosing to try on the material and then shed it. And it, it emulates these cycles, these feminine and powerful cycles of shedding and there's so much power in that. And I really think of, you know, these charged associations with the pantyhose and women's bodies, um, lots of different things. People have many associations. Personally, I think of um, societal expectations of perfectionism in women's bodies. And I see when shedding this material, kind of a, a metaphorical form of shedding these synthetic ideologies we've worn on our bodies as our own skin for most of our lives. So in activating the sculpture through performance, that's really what I was exploring. So yes, thank you for listening. Thank you, Rose. Um, and next we have Rosa Naprasek. Hi. Um, listening to all of you, I'm very, very moved by several things the beauty and significance and meaning of your work and what you have to say about yourselves and your work. I uh, always begin my artist statement with, I'm gonna read. I am a political activist. Oh, I'm a visual artist and a political activist although not in the usual sense of the word. And listening to you, you all are political activists, not in the usual sense of the word. And I think that that is a very, very critical thing for our time, for all times. One of the things I'm most interested in is developing a body politic, a body politic, integrating knowing and feeling and the personal political. And I'm saying it in you know, two lines, but all of you have expressed it through your work and what you're doing. And I'm, I think it's critical. I'm interested in the connection between the aesthetic experience and personal transformation. And that's what we're really doing here. That's what I think you're doing here. Personally, I've always been concerned with questions of cruelty and its source within us. And there is nothing more cruel than what is going on in terms of how women are being punished, drawn and quartered. It's almost inconceivable to what extent, quote unquote, they lie awake creating tortures, ways to diminish our humanity. Why? Of course, it's not the only thing or only cruelty going on in our world. It's our history. Every civilization has its own way of acting out its own distortions. I have come to believe that the source of cruelty lies in our ability to deny our own pain, fear, and vulnerability. And in order to avoid the reality of who we are as human beings, we uh, 
create the most horrific situations, not only for ourselves, but for others. So in my work, I'm concerned and interested in creating contexts to explore what these emotions are, how they distort and prevent opportunity for not only understanding, but for love. I, prevent my, I present my artwork whenever I can in conjunction with community building circles to offer a safe space to explore and share who we are and try to get together a, a small but diverse group of people and create a sacred space. These, uh, I'm going to talk about these two pieces, but they're not really the most current work that I'm doing. But I'd like to um, talk about these in terms of cruelty. The, um, I'd like to talk about the one with the uh, lampshade for the skirt. The hand is holding a cleaver, and it's called en route. And I'd like to read, I found it very difficult to describe my artwork and I decided I'll try doing so uh, in some kind of poetic or poetry form. And it's been so much easier for me to enter submissions. So on route, I have labored hard using graceful implements of wood and steel keeping quiet every meal with little bell to quell the fury in my heart, unseen, unheard, as I am minced, was minced, chopped, was chopped, till cut from myself, see myself awake to the power in my hand, an object of agency en route to freedom. And a part of the string that's being held has a little bell. The other piece is actually a reference to uh, Gustave Courbet's The Origin of the World, which is a painting of his, a very revolutionary painting of a woman's, they say, vulva. Vulva instead of vagina, because it encompasses the whole, the whole flower. And the painting then and even now at the Met, when it's shown, is often a section because it was originally considered pornographic. So this is a ceramic vulva. The ceramic piece was done by a friend of mine, Risa Ehrlich, and it's sitting in a hat, a pedal hat, those old hats that, you know, vintage hats, and there's a rake pulling, pulling at it. And the uh, description of it is never again, hollowed petals holding the beginning of the world, mauled to death by a rake that should be tilling fertile earth. And this is essentially what I think they're doing to us. But at the same time, we have the power. In the question and answer period, I will share with you what I think needs to be done. But I'd like to say a little bit about the, I don't know how much time I have left, but the project I'm working on. I am working on this project for 50 years since I had my abortion in 1973 at the time of Roe v. Wade. It was one of the first legal abortions, if not the first legal abortion in Michigan. And the night before I celebrated with my friends this wonderful opportunity to have a safe legal abortion. However, the state of Michigan was not prepared at all and had brought in a doctor from Queens who had injured many women. And unbeknownst to the uh, clinic and anybody else, he was, he was the abortionist. And basically, um, uh, I have to stop for a moment. It was an awful experience and one of the worst abortions. I was put in the hospital for five months and as a result of that, it changed my life. But how it changed my life, it's very interesting. It forced me to explore 
what allowed that to happen in our society, what can be done about it, and what needs to be the dialogue around abortion. And I've come to the place where I am interested in creating, just as you are in the works you're doing, a different terrain, a different opportunity for talking to one another, to bring in diverse audience, viewers, to engage in a sacred space, a place to go underneath, to raise the conversation. So the um, project is, be is being called Eternal Evidence, an abortion and the politics of presence. And uh, Deborah, earlier on, when you spoke about art, you described those moments in art, the aesthetic experience, its transformative power. And I believe that in creating a context for that and also testing whether a personal story and the evolution within me from a politic of anger and upset to one of creating an empathic human arena, whether that can help change the dialogue. And I think that um, it has to, and that's where our power lies. And thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Rosa. That was wonderful. Um, next, we have Brenda Nosso. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Brenda. Hi, hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Brenda Nwesser, she, her, and I hail from the Northeast um, here in the US. Uh, so it's wonderful to be a part of this talk and this exhibition with everyone. Um, when I first learned about it, it this piece kind of burned a hole in my brain to come out. Um, it was one of those things that I had so many other things going on, but I knew I had to create this and to submit it. And I was so honored to be accepted and, and to be a part of this with all of you. So thank you um, for all of your work at Hera. Thank you everyone who participated because it's been an amazing uh, 52 weeks or 51 weeks, however many weeks we, we have left to go in the year. Um, so my piece is called uh, Period Pad Burial Shroud. Um, it is meant to be on the nose. It's meant to be upfront in the naming, which I'm usually not um, as upfront with that, but I wanted to make sure that there was no misunderstanding um, in what the piece is supposed to represent. Um, I am a big advocate of period parity. Um, for those who menstruate, the idea that we have the period pad has been part of shaming of our biology, shaming for our socioeconomic status, shaming for our need to just be, to just exist in this world. And in kind of relationship to Roe v. Wade, this idea that it also means that it's an increased likelihood of our death. Um, and that oftentimes is because of pregnancy. Um, and complications that come with pregnancy or pregnancy type things. Um, these are major medical conditions. And so it was a reminder to kind of put it in people's faces that there's been so much shame about menstruators and it's been so much shame about who we are and shame around abortion itself, even before Roe v. Wade fell, that I just wanted to have a statement piece that talked about it. Um, this piece is made to the size of an American girl doll. Um, the original piece itself was going to be full size um, and interactive. Um, I'm a visual artist who, who attempts to make uh, accessible art. I want to draw people in and let them have their own experiences. So this was originally going to be full size, um, but there was a deadline. So I needed to, to make it a little more proportional. And I specifically chose the American Girl doll because it affects so many of us, including you know, young women just barely menstruating who are, fight, are facing challenges with this as well um, for circumstances that are not under their control. So it is on purpose that this represents so many of us in this country, if not, um, if not beyond. Um, it is made out of silk. 
Uh, traditionally, burial shrouds are made out of natural fiber, so they can decompose, but I chose silk specifically because, again, most of the time women are thought to be put on a pedestal, um, or and silk is, is a way to think about that. So it's embroidered, it is um, two different kinds of silk, um, then it has red wool dots that represent the states where abortion was banned at the time, and then the 13 states where it was very, very difficult. And I think, as we all know, that has just increased as the as the time has passed. So that's one of the ways that this piece has changed, which is really sad and really makes me angry and makes me feel all of these different emotions about how people cannot have private medical decisions with medical professionals that we need judges or we need politicians or we need people who don't have any idea what that our biology looks like telling us what we can and cannot do. Um, and then lastly too with this piece uh, there are three pieces of red silk that tie it closed if you actually fold up and you were to wrap it around um, a, a body or <laughs> an American girl doll in this case. Um, and those represent um, a shout out to our women of color who are two to three times higher risk of maternity mortality. And there are lots of varying reasons for that, um, but it is a shout out and a recognition that oftentimes there are moments in intersectionality that we don't necessarily um, touch upon or raise enough awareness to. So that was just my shout out. Um, I think for me personally, um, you know, for me personally, over the past year, what this has done for me is really helped me shape what kind of artist I want to be going forward. Um, I have always been an activist. Um, I have always been uh, engaged in local community and in, in social um, activism. But as an artist, I was kind of struggling. I was doing a lot of realism. Um, I was doing photography and realism photography, um, mixed media, but I didn't really have a, a firm sense of direction. And this is one of the pieces that I can look to in the past year that really helped me decide that artistic activism was something that I wanted to focus on. And it led to my latest piece being something that I'm really, really proud of in relation as a reaction to gun violence. So I'm, I'm really, again, grateful for this opportunity, not just to be part of of this exhibition, but what it has mean, meant for me personally um, in my journey as an artist. So thank you. Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, next we have Melanie Pitch. Um, and would you like me to play the video first or would you like to talk first, Melanie? Um, you can go ahead and play it, sure. Sure, I think um, we have enough time for everything.
to say something. Delicious. Whoops. What happened there? There we go. <laughs> okay, Melanie, take it away. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm in San Francisco. I'm, I'm a sculptor. Sculptor, excuse me. And uh, I started to think about making an art piece about abortion back in, I guess, 2020, maybe 2019. Uh, but at the time when the states were starting to pass the heartbeat, the six week abortion bans. And it, I was just so infuriated as so many of us um, are and were. And I'm a former lawyer and I first began looking at this problem from a legal perspective. I was looking at the language of the legislation and I wanted to find a way to say that those laws were unconstitutional, that the logic behind them was flawed, that their science was religion but I couldn't come up with an argument that was you know, different than all the other legal arguments that people were banding about. And so I kept putting the project down. And then I finally had an epiphany, remembering that this is art and that I'm an artist now and I don't need to win an argument and that my true interest was in expressing how I and others are feeling about what was happening to our rights. And that was my jumping off point for this piece. And I went back to the legislation and started looking, you know, state by state, researching the vote counts and just looking at who was voting yes on the most restrictive abortion bans. You know, what was their gender? What was their race? And I realized that the yes votes were coming from incredibly high percentages of white males. Now, you might think that should have been obvious that white males were passing these laws because there are more white males than women or persons of color in state legislatures. Um, but then I realized that wasn't really an answer or an explanation. That's just a reality that raises a whole host of other issues and problems. So from there, I really started to imagine uh, a white male speaking directly to a woman or to me and telling her or me that uh, we had to go through with an unwanted pregnancy, you know, because, and that because in my mind has a lot to do with power, whether it's small power, like someone who, wants to hold on to their elected position or big power, uh, like someone with more nefarious social uh, objectives to accomplish. Um, but anyway, oh, but uh, I guess just imagining that one-on-one -on -one dynamic uh, was kind of a wow, like, you know, how many male politicians one-on-one -on -one would really have the balls to do that, to say that to someone um, and, so from there, with that one-on-one -on -one anger and emotion, that's the point or the place from which I wrote that text. And I guess in terms of the glass, conceptually, I was thinking about the idea of the breaking the glass was almost like an act of vandalism, someone without power on the outside, kicking in anger against the larger system. Um, and you don't really see it in the video, but uh, I think... The, the act of writing on the glass um, and going through that process is e of equal importance to the smashing of the glass, just because the writing is very calm, very measured. It belies the anger and emotion of the text and the surrounding issue. Um, and then obviously the breaking of the glass and it's an expression of frustration, of anger, of power, 
it's like a smashing of paternalism, um, glass ceilings and male control. Um, and I, I'll share that uh, when I was breaking the glass, I was really surprised as to how emotional it kind of felt. Um, it was a lot more than I had expected. Um, obviously I was trying to film it straight through and I felt kind of choked up when I got to that last panel. Um, and I guess someday I'd love to do this piece of the long live performance with people really seeing and sitting with both aspects of the work, uh, both seeing the text be written on the glass panels and then also seeing the smashing of the glass. Uh, and I guess just in terms of some of the things that we were thinking about in the email that was circulated, I did just want to briefly mention Barbara Kruger and Jenny Holzer as two female um, artists whose powerful work is text-based, um, just so clean, simple, thought-provoking. Um, and I guess maybe because of my legal background, I do come back to text. I can't, you know, as a sculptor, I can't always, I'm not always feeling like I can get, I can get my message out with just pure form and materials. And so sometimes I feel like, oh, I'm get too text heavy, but then I come back to these two. Uh, you know, they, their work is so powerful. So uh, I guess the other thing I wanted to say was that I was so excited to get the call for this show. And um, I, I was just finishing up the piece at the time and was very excited to be chosen to display it in this format. So thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Play the video again. Okay. Um, and next we have Denal Poppy. Denal, are you here? Okay, I don't think she's with us. Um, so let's pop over to Larissa Yusek. Hi there, it's such an honor to be here with you all in this show and in this conversation. Thank you so much to Hera for um, putting this all together. Um, so I am also in the Bay Area. I am an MFA student at San Jose State, and I created this work, The Womb in the Room, um, in the fall of 2022. So sort of my midway show through um, my MFA program. Um, I couldn't think about making work about anything else at that time, right? So we're coming out of the overturning of Roe. And it was the only thing that I wanted to make work about then. Um, and it has kicked off since then. Um, similarly, it sounds like to some of you, um, a series of works that are addressing body autonomy. Uh, my thesis project right now, I'm delving into using the concept of pants metaphorically, who wears them, who's in charge of them, but incorporating people of all genders to be responding to that. Um, if any of you are interested, it's a participatory um, work. Um, and that's what I discovered through this work. I am getting my degree in sculpture, but I really love social practice and participation. So this work, I fabricated the frame in steel. It is 14 feet wide by seven feet tall. Um, hard to see the angle of it here, but it is the uterus is open inside and is um, that is a collaborative weaving done in wool. So I invited people to come to my studio and participate in the weaving. And while they were in there, um, I just got to hear so many stories about people's lives and about their connections with the uterus. And um, I loved that this project in you know creating this elephant in the room as a um, vehicle to talk and to listen um, not only happened in the gallery space, but through the whole making of it. Um, and the, you know, some of the close-up shots that are on the website as well show, you know, a fibroid that, you know, a mother and daughter had come in and woven together and talked about the history of fibroids in their family and the difficulty in getting pregnant and what that meant for them. They'd use pieces of hospital gown um, tied together to make this fibroid and embed it in. 
I had an OBGYN from clinic who came to my studio in her scrubs. She'd come out of a, out of 24 hours of being on call. And I, uh, she was a knitter. Someone referred her to my project because they thought she would want to be part of it. And she sat in my studio for two hours and knit and talked to me, you know, more stories of what she's been through as a doctor, but also, um, um, honestly about uteruses and what they look and feel like. And I just remember her sitting there at one point and saying, I wish you could feel what a fallopian tube feels like. Um, and I, I said, that's why you're here. That's why you're part of this. And so the stories of what people told me about as they were participating in this really became part of the work. And I brought that into the gallery space. So in, in the back of the room, I had a place with other pieces of wool and yarn that when you came to experience it, I said, this is, you can touch this work, you can add to the work, um, talk through the work. So these cones um, at the end are made out of porcelain that are attached to these hollow steel tubing. Um, so they were, they conducted sound really well. So you could talk and listen to someone else through it. Um, people got inside and that was something that surprised me is the way that people acted when they got in people um, kind of some people got in more of a fetal position one person kind of was stretched out and stuck and shared that she'd always been told she was you know had a difficult labor her mom had a difficult labor and couldn't give birth to her because of the position she was in and people just went into the and, you know really it was really fascinating and they loved being in it because the wool muffled the sound around um, sometimes two friends would get in it together um, I was hoping for twins at some point, but um, yeah, so it was, you know, the, 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 the piece did what I was intending as far as facilitating conversation. I'm looking for new places to put the physical work because part of my reflecting um, based on the conversation we're having today about, you know, what's different in the last year and a half, clearly conversation and discussion like we're having now is what's needed in you know, broadly, and to not have the discussion of a uterus um, be something or, you know, periods or some of the things you guys are mentioning, you know, menopause for me now, as I enter into that, not have them be things that are strange to talk about all, you know, just naturally. Um, so I love that with this work, you know, men who were part of my program or who'd be wandering by, I mean, I learned more of about their thoughts and experiences with, you know, either their mother or a partner or other things going on with people with uterus is just physically having it there created all these conversations that wouldn't have otherwise happened. Um, so, and I'll mention the other um, component of this other than the wool and the steel is I have the exterior um, is clad in and woven in eucalyptus bark. Um, there are some images on the website that show it from the back so you can see. Um, for me, um, it is significant. It was referring, as one of you mentioned in your work, to shedding. So I have the concept of shedding, but also bark as protection. Um, I was reading at the time, um, Suzanne Simard's Finding the Mother Tree. So for me, it's also referencing this idea um, of mother trees and the tree roots of different women connecting to each other. Um, because although this is one uterus in this work, um, for me, this was a very collective type of piece. And, um, um, you know, that, that that bark was was referencing that for me in, in, in the piece. Um, also referenced for me in thinking back to the 70s and thinking about Women House in LA, there was a wonderful work created by um, uh, Faith Wilding called the crocheted environment that got referred to as the womb room. Um, so I think back to that time and the work created then, um, you know, and how we're, this is, this feels cyclical to me, you know, what we're, um, what we're doing now again in having conversations and needing to bring these things back up and, and, um, you know, evoke new, dialogue and, and fight a new fight around it. Um, it's been inspiring to hear about all the things that you guys are, are creating in this space. Um, yeah, so I think that um, that is it for now for me. Um, and I look forward to further conversation at the end of our
our talks. Thank you, Larissa. Um, and I think this is our last artist um, before our Q&A, um, G.E. Vought. Hi. Yes, thank you. And I, I first want to start by apologizing for my lateness. Holiday traffic was a thing. So I'm so sorry. I'm excited to go back and see what everybody else was was talking that that I missed about about your work. Um, so hi, I'm I'm G.E. Vaught. I'm a social political uh, collage artist in Southern California, um, in San Diego. Um, and it's interesting when, when I was thinking about reflecting on these pieces, I was reflecting on sort of uh, how long I've been doing social political artwork. And it's been about 15 years or so, but I sort of feminist topics and, and women's topics were never one of my um, priority topics. Like I, I deal a lot with like climate change, with socioeconomic gap, um, with all these different issues until um, a few years ago when it just became um, so much more urgent, I think, than, than it had been. Like it was always in the back of my mind of like, oh, here's topics to sort of explore at some point. But in the past past few years, it, there's just been an urgency um, that I personally as a social political artist had not felt before. Um, so this was a, a series, part of a series that I began after SB 8 was passed in Texas, the law that um, uh, gave people $10,000 for um, turning in anyone who helped a woman procure um, an abortion. And it just struck a very intense nerve, um, The this idea of vigilantism, this idea of um, uh just going after women and people who help women um, in, in this way. Um, so I began a, a series that, uh, man, it's it's really hard. It was really hard to write about. It was really hard to talk about. Um, essentially replaced women as different types of, of food, as different types of meat of animals, um, because it felt like we were losing our personhood. We were losing our humanization. Um, and we were becoming not just property, but, um, you know, phrases like good enough to eat um, kept coming up for me, ready to be plucked is the name of one of these things, like phrases of how we describe women that um, turn us into not just property, but but animals um, to, to be treated in the same way as, as animals. And this idea that we no longer have body autonomy was connected um, with that idea of, of women as, as no longer human. Um, Reflecting on these pieces when I made them versus now, I remember when I was making them, I really struggled with with making these pieces because I worried that they were too violent. Um, chaining women, having women be chained, having women in these these positions. Um, I would make a piece and then since I'm a collage artist, you know, you, you put it together and then you paste it down. I would put it together and then I would just sit with it for a couple of weeks and be like, no, this is this is actually going too far. Like maybe this is too extreme. And I'm realizing uh, after thinking about it, um, since Roe fell, I have sort of the opposite reaction of maybe these didn't go far enough um, because the violence against women since Roe fell um, is so, it's not theoretical anymore. It is so real. Um, this, this violence against women um, who are being forced to carry unwanted pregnancies or even wanted but unviable pregnancies. I mean, this this is violence that is affecting uh, people's mental and emotional health, their physical health, um, in in ways that uh, you know was really hard for me to reckon with when we were talking about SB eight. But but seeing the consequences of what happened after Roe uh, made me wonder if I was a little too tame in in this series, um, which is something I've been sort of reckoning with is how how do we use art as a way to um, strike people in in a different way in a way that um, I, I don't want to just do shock and awe but I when we just hear these sort of like theoretical oh this could happen to women or this is how they they could be affected it's very different than when you see something that strikes you viscerally and so with with a lot of my social political work I try to strike people um, viscerally the, the hard thing in creating this kind of work, it, and I'm sure some of you are going through this as well, is that it also strikes you viscerally as well when, when you're making it, um, which has been a, an interesting um, thing to, to reckon with in making this kind of art. Um, one of the, the things that I'm so appreciative towards um, Hera Gallery in, in particular is that 
in making this exhibition, they didn't just do a one month exhibition of, you know, right after Roe fell, like, oh, let's look at this issue. Great. We're done with it. Let's move on. Like this, this idea of continuing the conversation and continuing this exhibition for a whole year has been really, really powerful. Um, particularly because I, I feel like there was a lot of, um, I was seeing a lot of artwork. I was seeing a lot of movement when Roe first fell. And then as things do, the conversations change, topics change, things fade away. And it's been less and less and less. Um, even though on a lot of us, clearly it's still affecting us very, very deeply. And we're creating art about it and we're thinking about it. Um, and we're, we're, you know, still feel as strongly and passionately about it now as we, um, did with Roe and, and even, you know, much farther before Roe. Um, so I'm very, very grateful to be part of this exhibition. Absolutely. But I'm also just so grateful to, to Hera Gallery for keeping this conversation going, for reminding people that this was not just a thing that happened a year ago and now it sucks to be, you know, a woman dealing with it. But other than that, move on. I am, I am so appreciative of keeping this this conversation and this topic at, at front of mind and and in people's um uh in their bandwidth because it is not going away unless we continue to um to talk unless we continue to have conversations we continue to make art and we continue to to make it prevalent so um that's all i i wanted to say is thank you so much hara gallery for your work it is really meaningful Thank you so much. Um, and I can't think of a better way to segue into our Q&A. Um, perfect timing. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Marissa, um, who will open this for us. Hi, uh, I'm Marissa. Um, I'm the gallery assistant. Uh, everything that I just heard was amazing. Um, uh, I have. I will start off the questions. Um, I will ask a question to, for uh, Rosa. Um, I was curious about uh, what uh, led you to choose uh, the materials that you cho you used, like the uh, the lampshade and things like that. Well, I'm a found object artist. Uh, I also found art quite by accident. So. Um, my life before doing art, I was also an attorney and I could not tolerate the adversarial process. So I, I stopped practicing and uh, just ex experimented with other things. So essentially I began doing art because I found a lot of things that objects and had them around and then they asked to be joined with one another. So a lot of what I did was unconscious and then I would look at, uh, I put this with that, oh, this wants this, that wants that. And lo and behold, something would emerge and I'd take a look at it. Oh, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm feeling. So in a sense, I did not particularly choose these. I just had a collection. And now I have a collection that has taken over a three bedroom apartment. So sorry to disappoint. Uh, the intentionality is unconscious and things just talk to one another and ask to be placed together. That was very fascinating. Thank you. Um, now we will start uh, questions. Does anyone else have a question? You can raise your hand or put it in the chat or just talk. I actually have a follow-up question for Rosa, and I'm curious about whether the poetry is now coming first when you're looking at the objects, or do you finish the piece before you kind of write the poem? How no, does that the, work together? The poems come by looking at the object, at the uh, artwork. And I, I've been writing, uh, writing, I've been writing rhymes since I was a child. And uh, happily, I, I stopped being obsessive about rhyming. But no, I, I take a look at what it is and I ask myself, what is this? And then uh, fortunately, if I'm quiet enough, the words come just the way the um, objects ask to be together. I am a great believer in silence as the um, opening for speech. Thank you. 
Are there any other questions? Not so much a question, but I wanted to, to follow up on something that G said um, about continuing the conversation. Um, and it's another reflection on where we are with, you know, post Roe v. Wade is um, if you've been following funding for, you know, abortion funding in your states, or if your reproductive services are getting people to places where they can have safe abortions, that funding, those donations from folks has fallen significantly in the months following. Um, and it's not that it's not important to people. I get, again, it's just not front and center. So the art that we've made, the art that Hera has shown over the past year is super important, but also important just to keep the conversation alive so we can keep those dollars going to places that are helping folks who are in these situations and have access to safe medical care um, to help them. Thank you. Does anybody else have questions or comments, conversation? Um, I have a question for Melanie, um, which I guess I'm just sort of curious about how your work lives um, now and how you envision it for the future, because you were talking about how you wanted it to be this participatory piece of um in this performance of the writing and the smashing so is this a series of ongoing different writings or are you recreating this multiple times does the piece live as smashed or do you is this a done piece and you're going to make something new well that's a good question i have a uh... A number of five gallon buckets full of smashed glass that I can't bring myself to part with. I'm not exactly sure. I feel like there's there's another life there, but um, I guess we'll see. Um, and yeah, I mean, I feel like I would like to do this. Like I said, I would like to do the piece live. I'd probably have to update um, or maybe think at this point now it's been so long, you know, I'd have to go back and see if I wanted to change anything, if, you know, uh, yeah, whether, I mean, I think the question would be in those percentages and whether there's other stuff now that's going on that might be more relevant too. But I mean, I, I still think that the, um, the gist of it and the, the power dynamic that is going on and the, um, I mean, I also feel like the language, at least I've heard from others, when you're, you know, you're putting it that way or the way that I did, it does really, I mean, I've heard from men and women, I just, there is an anger there that it, I think it kind of lays it all bare, you know, so there's some of that no that I wouldn't change, um, and, you know, I've, I've applied, I guess I've put in um, applications to do a live performance in two. One was a no, I mean, it was a gallery that you can tell that I, I, there's a certain amount of danger, I think, in the smashing of the glass too for bystanders. Um, but it is probably an issue that, you know, not everybody wants to tackle, so. We'll see. I'll keep trying. It, um, and that made me just think of um, with all the glass like that you mentioned you have in these like piles of glass and watching you break this glass is also like, you know, breaking the glass ceiling or whatever. And um, I had read this quote um, from some someone actually wrote um, this to me and it was like um, talking about womanhood and um, that they can't separate womanhood from trauma, but that everyone calls them resilient and saying, oh, you're so resilient all the time. You're so resilient all the time. And she was like, but I'm, I'm sick of being resilient. I don't want to have to be resilient. I don't want to have to climb over all these things. And I'm like thinking of just like all your piles of glass that could just be like, you could do this so many times and the glass would just keep building and it gets to a point where it's like, we don't want to keep smashing this all the time. Like it's anger and it feels good. And we did it and we climbed to the top of this pile, but it's 
also just, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to yeah, swear. Repet- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Repetitive and exhausting. <laughs> And I agree. There's something really powerful about using the material of glass here, you know, the the act of breaking it, but then, you know, all the references to it, which you mentioned when you, you spoke about glass ceilings and the violence of, you know, breaking and entering, or, you know, I think there's so much, um, I've just started casting in glass. So when you're like, I have all these buckets and don't know what to do with it, form it into something. (laughs) I'll email you. (laughs) Exactly. Um, You know, that I've enjoyed that similar kinds of processes with breaking ceramic as well. And just there's there's a release with with that. Um, but, you know, as we've been talking, I, I noticed a lot of us are from California and I and maybe from states where um, abortion rights have a lot of support. And I'm interested in us talking about if if anyone is from a state where um, abortion is banned and and or also is getting involved in making art that are in those places. Um, I mean, I applied to have my piece be in Texas. It was not accepted. Um, so I'm just curious to hear um, how y- you're thinking about or doing outreach into places where where people are, are seeing these things in another way. Um, I'm not sure if anyone on here is from a state where abortion is banned. Um, and I hope you jump in if I'm wrong, but I, I just want to speak up and say that I do know we have a few artists who are not here, um, who went by different names or went by initials, um, for that reason and for not, um, being, uh, represented, um, with exactly who they are, um, for safety concerns. I have a question. Of course. Okay. What, what I want, what I'm wondering, is it? It feels to me as if the um, resistance to what is going on is not that strong. Among women, among among younger women. Uh, what do you think? How do you how do you see it? I'm not talking about the group here. <laughs> well, I, 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 I wonder. I'm thinking that it's dependent on where, you know, what locale you're in, what resistance would look like. You know, I think that for young women in the Bay Area, they are furious about it in in other places. What's happening for girls and young women, but it's not an issue for them personally. Yeah, in California, so it's like they feel it nationally. Um, or for example, my daughter attends school out of state. It is in a place where it's legal, but there's a Planned Parenthood across the street that she sees out her apartment window. And, um, there, you know, there are people there protesting every day and holding vigil every Friday night and everything. So, um, it's very much a part of her daily life and, you know, she's furious about it. Um, and, you know, I, I, but I, I hear what you're saying. Like, it's not very visible. I talked with someone from Mexico city who said, I can't, you know, when, when abortion was, was threatened there to become illegal, people were just took to the streets and, and were furious. And, you know, other than a few, or a few, you know, protests and marches we had here initially, it's, this is not, and few, few of you have mentioned it. It's not top of mind right now. It's not what people are pounding the pavement about at the moment, for sure. I think part of the difficulty of the time that we live in right now is that there are so many issues. Do you know what I mean? Like there are just so many things to be upset or scared or angry about um, that for like me, abortion is, is top of mind, even though I'm in uh, SoCal, a lot of my friends and family are still back in Ohio where I'm from. Um, So for me, it's, it's very uh, top of mind and very prevalent. And for my, my women friends and and family back there, it it particularly is, but then add in the 20 other issues that you see, you know, in the news or your social media, or just like in, in your daily life. Um, I, I think people in general and, and particularly um, I can only imagine it's harder for young folks who are 
sort of growing up inundated in a way that like I was not with, with social media. Um, I can imagine that it's difficult to uh, focus on being the most angry about this one issue, if that makes sense. And from my experience, I found for a lot of people, um, not just with this issue, but particularly with socially, social political art, particularly with the social political you know, um, subject, they don't think about it until it affects them, right? And that's that's not, you know, through lack of neglect or not caring. It's just it hits differently when it affects you or when it affects someone you know. Um, and I think we're still learning how to normalize talk about abortion, how like, you know, most people like every you everybody knows somebody who had an abortion, even if you don't know that you know them. Um, but we're not at, at that point where I think it's normalized to the point where people recognize how many people they know it's affecting them, which then would make them care about it more, if that makes sense. Sorry, that's a little long-winded. I think that uh, Jenny drew the parallel with this issue and other issues. Jenny, I think you were talking about climate issues in the beginning. I just want to jump back to the video. Was, was it Melanie who did the video? I know this is sort of very disturbing take on it, but I could, with the smashing, I couldn't help also thinking about the violence against women. And I also, you know, um, I, I know this is it's kind of radical, but just, you know, the idea of breaking the glass in, in the wedding, in the Jewish wedding ritual and the man stamps on it. And I never thought about it before, but I think in some sort of, archaic way, maybe it's talking about, um, you know, like a violation or something, you know, it, it feels kind of overwhelming. I know that Melanie, that's not the way you were, you were talking about smashing the, um, you know, the glass ceiling and, and smashing out the limitations um, and things that are holding us back. But when I see violence, I also revert to, you know, the, the violence, the violence that is perpetrated against women as well. Just wanted to put that out there. Well, I guess, yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I was a little worried about, is this too violent? You know, are people gonna take this the wrong way? But at the same time, I felt like it was a woman who was doing it and it was a woman who was taking back the power in a sense. and. So that in my mind made it made it better. And but about the other comment about what's going on with um, abortion and are people caring enough and doing enough about it? And I I think it will be interesting to see next year how many states are going to have it on their ballot because it does seem like there are you know when it's come up to for a vote. I think there have been two. I'm not could be wrong, but I think two that have past um, amendments to state constitutions uh, recently where, you know, it turns out that the, um, and this may not be true everywhere, obviously, but the people who are voting, the people who are affected by these laws have views that are different from the politicians, you know, who are passing these restrictions. So, I mean, fingers crossed for next year for that. Yeah. I, oh, sorry, Rosa, I didn't mean to talk over you. No, that's fine. Go ahead. I think the other thing, too, to, to consider is that, you know, we often think about action as taking to the streets, right? And we think of it as physical protesting and physical marching. But that's also something of a privilege, right? If we're, in, we're at a point where a federal ruling has fallen, so those of us who feel safe, are those who are in states that recognize <laughs> our bodily autonomy and those who don't feel safe are in states where they don't feel safe to potentially organize. And that's even beyond the idea of how much people have been affected by COVID and how much poverty is happening and how much people um, are nervous about being in gatherings. It's about, you know, the intimidation factor that people, Many more people are being intimidating as counter protesters. Um, so there, I think there are a lot of things that 
there are actions like voting that are happening, maybe in a quieter space, but not necessarily what we think of as taking to the streets and and you know having our voices heard in that type of way. Um, but yes, I I I think a lot of times um, about privilege when I go to protests um, because it is it's privilege to take that time off. It's privilege to have a space where you think your voice is gonna be heard. You know, I'm in a state and I live in a location where I'm close to our capital. So I feel like my voice can be heard. But if you're in a larger state, like say California, um, you may be further away from a place where you think your voice will be heard by legislators. Um, you know, there's so much that goes around safety. Um, I talked about intersectionality and the difference in how people of color or women of color or queer people feel when they go out to protest. Again, when we're talking about counter protesters or pictures taken or names being taken down. So I think we're just in a, a different time, especially with social media and cameras, that we just need to be aware that sometimes that what we think of historically as having your voices be heard is just changed a bit. But it makes it harder because I feel nervous. I'm like, I hope people really are doing the quiet actions. <laughs> Thank well, you. Sarah. I think that's like just so important to bring up and a really big reason why we wanted to do this show um, is like we have such a privilege. We're based in Rhode Island and there are two Planned Parenthoods within a 90 minute drive um, of the gallery. And that's just unheard of in m most of the country. Um, so it's like, okay, we can have a show, we can do this, we can have a protest, but like, what are we really doing? And I feel like it's almost like rubbing it in other people's faces, like people need help. And like, we're not gonna having a show isn't helpful. Like if you can't get here or if you can't be here or if you can't be a part of it. So being online or sharing resources online or making something that is quiet and safe um, that people can find. Um, and a big part of the show for me, too, was um, when I had and I, I wrote this in the call and I had typed in um, hashtag abortion on Instagram. The first one that came up was abortion is evil. Um and I think of like the first thing people do now, or especially um, what young people do now, if they need help is you Google something and all of the fake clinics um, that are out there when you turn to Google. Um, so how can we like keep promoting and just like posting viable information um, and networks out there so people can find um, the help that they need? Um, we're at 8.29 for time, so I don't know if anyone wants to add a final thought or suggestion or comment or feeling um, before we sign off. Well, what I had in mind was men organizing, getting them organized and out in the streets, or doctors not or having it when doctors perform an abortion to have a whole group of people behind them. The suffragettes uh, fill the jails. I mean, this is a war on women. And it's also devising the most heinous tortures. And the outrage is not loud enough. And I understand what you're saying, of course. But and they put the fear of uh, of God into everyone also. So it's a challenge to put it mildly. Let's get creative. So I think we found our answer to um my question at the beginning of our chat. What do we do now? Um be louder, be creative, um, and keep talking um, and keep making work. Um, so thank you all for this um, really lovely um, and touching discussion tonight. Um, I'll have this, um, it's recorded and I'll have it posted um, by tomorrow evening for sure. Um, so you can share it um, this weekend and um, wishing everyone some safe 
um, happy and healthy holidays um, and happy new year. And thank you again. Thank you, Jenny. This was extraordinary. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you. Oh, now we can see everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs>